bless you. This morning, I want to talk about um, an aspect of the theme for the year. You know, the theme for the year is a people of God unleashed to transform their world. And today, I want to share with you an aspect of that theme, and I have titled the message, The People of God, The People of God. And in this message, I would attempt to explain who the people of God are, and when we say the people of God, what do we exactly mean? And also, some privileges we have as the people of God. And if time would permit me, I'll talk about one responsibility we have as the people of God. And so this morning, I just want to talk to you on the topic, the people of God. You see, the Bible describes the church in various forms. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Specifically, the Bible mentions a few things about the church and which I want to draw your attention to. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says that, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so from this scripture, people of God, we can really identify um, about four or five ways that the church has been described. In the first place, the church is described as a chosen race. In other words, the church is described as a special people. We are a chosen race. God has chosen us. We are special to God. We are a different race altogether. And so the first thing is that we are a chosen race. And the second thing is that the Bible describes the church as a family of royals, a family of royals, meaning that we are kings and princesses. And this is what the Lord has made us. The Lord has made us princes and kings. The Lord has made us part of the family of royals. So he says that, but you are a chosen generation and a royal, a family of royals. But not only that, God describes the church as also a family of priests, a family of priests, meaning that we belong to the priesthood and all of us. So when we talk of the priesthood, we are not talking about the apostle, the pastor, or the one in clerical alone, but we are talking about the church. The church, all of us, are part of the family of priests. And so the church, one, is a chosen race. Two, the church is a royal priesthood a royal priest, a family of royals, and a family of priests. We belong to the priesthood, each and every one of us. But let me, also, let me say that you are who God says you are. When God says you are something, well, God say, describes you as being something. You are. Whoever God says you are, you indeed you are. And so if God is saying that we are a chosen race, then indeed we are a chosen race. If God is saying that we are a family of royals, indeed there is no doubt about that we are a family of royals. And if God is saying that we are a family of priests, indeed we are part of the priesthood. And not only that, the Bible describes us as a holy nation meaning that we have been set apart as a people. We are unique in God's sight. God has set us apart, and he has made us holy. And then of God, we, of course, we are a people of his own possession. His people, we belong to him, and thus we are the people of God. And so each and every one of us here are not ordinary people. We are not just ordinary people, but we are unique people in the sight of God. We are his royal priesthood. We are his own possession. We belong to him. We don't belong to any other person. We don't belong to any other people. But we belong to God, the creator, the most high, the one that created the heavens and earth, the one that holds the whole universe in his hands. And he is saying that we are his um, treasured possession. And I want to say it again, that you indeed are who God says you are. And so if God is saying that you are my possession, then indeed you are his possession. And so as we walk around, we go up and down, let us always have it at the back of our minds that we are not ordinary people, but we are God's own people. Can I hear him in church? But the question that has actually engaged our minds, people of God, is that who are the people of God? When we say that the people of God, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say some people are God's people? Um, and I want to pick it from the Old Testament and try to 
bring it into the New Testament for us to appreciate it very well. In the Old Testament, God chose Abraham and made a nation out of him. And then that nation became his treasured possession. That nation became his very own. In Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3, the Bible says that, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make you your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who dishonor you, I will curse. And in it, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God called Abraham and told Abraham that, Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to bless you. But in the first place, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. And I'm going to make a nation out of you. And I will bless your nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. Anyone that blesses you, I will bless. Anyone that dishonors you, I will curse. And so this was a promise that God gave to to Abraham. And indeed, of a truth, God is faithful, and whatever he says is the truth. And God will not say something and then turn his back at it. Immediately he speaks, he knows that he's going to do it. And so out of Abraham, the Bible says that God had a nation, Israel, and that nation became his own people. So out of Abraham, God had the nation, Israel, as his own people. In fact, the Lord spoke to them that so long as they obeyed him and that they would honor his word and follow him, they were going to be his treasured possession. And so God called Abraham, made a nation out of him, and God assured them that this nation is mine. So long as you would obey me, so long as you would honor my word, so long as you walk in my stead, you are going to be my treasured nation. And so the Bible says in Exodus that, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and this is God speaking to um, the people of Israel, and if you would obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the people of Israel. And so God commanded Moses that tell these people that if only they will walk in my ways, if only they will honor my word and obey my word, they are going to be my treasured possession. And so God has called Abraham and has made a nation out of him. And that nation, Israel, was God's people, was God's nation. But you see, people of God, when God chose Abraham, and the nation Israel, God still had his eyes on the rest of the world. God never forgot about the entire world. He just chose Israel so that Israel will be a conduit by which he will reach out to the rest of the world. So when God picked Abraham and God picked Israel, God had a purpose. He had a plan, and his plan was that he would reach the entire nations of the world through Israel. So you remember God told Abraham that out of you, the families of the world will be blessed. And so God had a plan, and his plan was to reach out to the entire world. The, his plan was to reach out to the entire nations of the world. And so he chose Israel as a conduit through which he would reach out to the entire world. And now, I'm happy to announce to you, people of God, that when we talk about the people of God, it is not the Jew nor the Gentile, but when we talk about the people of God, it is the church. Now, the church now is the people of God. And so when God says, you are my people, God is not referring to the Jew, and God is not also referring to the Gentile. But when God says that you are my people, the God is talking about the church. The church has become the people of God. And I will explain from scriptures. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 11 to 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. The Bible says that, therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, 
called the uncircumcision. And this is our description before we became born again. The Bible says that we were Gentiles in the flesh. We were called the uncircumcision by that what is called circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Then verse 12 says that, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And this is who we were, actually. We were people who were far away. And the Bible says that we were alienated from the promises of God, and we were people without God, and we were people without hope. This was our description. Far away. Remember that at that time, you were separated from Christ. And that is true. We were far away from Christ. Excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And so if we entered the house of God, we came there as strangers. We came there as people who did not have any God. We came there as people who were unfamiliar, people who were alienated from God. But the Bible says in verse 13 that, but now, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so by the blood of Christ, now we are not far away again, but by the blood of Christ, we have been brought near. But now in Christ Jesus, you who, were once, who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. And then he has broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. In fact, there was that wall that divided us. There was that wall that separated us from them and us. And so we had the Jews and we had the Gentiles. And there was a huge wall that separated us. But thanks be unto God that in Christ, that wall of hostility has been broken down. And so in Christ, there is no more Jew and there is no more Gentile. In Christ, there is the church. But the Bible says that that wall of hostility has been broken down and he has made us one. And so for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. And so he has one new man in place of the two. When he talks about the two, he talked about the Jews. He talked about the Gentiles. But thanks be unto God that out of the two, God has one new man. That one new man is the church. Out of the two, God has the church. And so we, are, we don't have the Jews any longer. Neither do we have the Gentiles any longer. But God looks at us, the church, and he's proud of us and he's happy about us. He looks at us and he calls us his own. He calls us his people. And so he has reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. I am happy to tell you that when God mentions the church, when God mentions the church, he's calling the people of God. When God mentions the people of God, he's referring to the church. It is no more the Gentile. It is no more the Jew. We do not have the Gentile and we do not have the Jew any longer. But we have the church, the body of Christ, the people of God. And so if you are part of the church, I want you to understand that you are part of the people of God. When God is calling his people, he's calling the church. When God is referring to his people, he's referring to the church. In the book of Peter, Peter explains this very clearly and well. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says that once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Formerly, we were not a people, but now not only are we a people, but we are also God's people. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not, you had not received mercy, but now we have mercy. And so 
by the grace of God and by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are God's people. When God looks at us, he sees us as his very own. We are his treasured possession. We belong to him and he also belongs to us. And I want you to understand that as you walk around, as you drive around, have it at the back of your mind that you are part of God's people. That you are not an ordinary, so long as you belong to the church, so long as you belong to the body of Christ, indeed you are part of God's people. And when God sees you, he sees you as his very own. You are his treasured possession. In the Old Testament era, in the book of Hosea, there are a few things that I want us to take note of. The Bible described as people who were without mercy and without a name. In Hosea chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible says that she conceived again and born a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name, no mercy. And so that was our name. We were no mercy for I will not have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. And so that was our name. He, we were called no mercy. It means we did not have any mercy. But things have changed. And then in verse 8 of the same Hosea chapter 1, the Bible says that when she had waned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said that, call his name, not my people. And so look at the description. First, we were called no mercy. And secondly, we were called not my people. We were not, we were called not the people of God. And that was our name. And our name best described us. We were described as people who were without mercy. And we were described as people who were without, who were not God's people. But now, Peter says that once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Now, once you were not have or you did not have mercy, but now you have received mercy. And that is why when we come to church, I want you to come with a heart of gratitude, realizing and understanding what God has done for you and appreciating what God has done in our lives, that we were people without mercy. We were people without, we, we were not God's people. But thanks be unto God that in this era, we are people who are with mercy and we are God's people. Some has happened. There is a change in the atmosphere. There is a change in the environment. And those of us who were not God's people can now call ourselves God's people. Those of us who were without mercy can now say that we have obtained mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1, the Bible says that formerly we were people who were walking under the wrath of God. But thanks be unto God that no more are we walking under the wrath of God. No more are we objects of God's wrath but we are people who have obtained mercy and now we are loved by God. God looks at us and he loves us. God looks at us and he appreciates us. When we walk around, we are objects of God's love. He has placed his love in us. No more the Jew, no more the Gentile, but the church. Out of the two, God has created one man. Out of the two, God has created one and God has made us his people. I want you to have that heart of gratitude always. Always thanking God and blessing God for what he has done. But the question is, how was this possible? It was made possible because of the blood. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13, the Bible says that, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once more, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so by the blood of Christ, our destiny has been changed. By the blood of Christ, our lives have been changed. By the blood of Christ, those of us who were not having mercy have become, we have obtained mercy. By the blood of Christ, those of us who were not God's people have become God's people. I remember that very good Friday when Jesus was arrested and when he was molested and was beaten. And the Bible says that they put a crown on his head, but that crown was a crown of thorns. They put it on his head, and they put on him a very big cross, a heavy cross, and they led him away to be, to be killed on Calvary. When the devil was doing all these things, he thought he was destroying Jesus. He thought he was bringing an end to, uh, to the life of Jesus. But what he didn't know was that by the shedding of the blood of Jesus, those of us who were far away were coming to 
coming closer and closer. Those who were not part of God's people, in the shedding of the blood of Jesus, we were becoming God's people. And that is why the Bible says that this was hidden from him. He did not know because if he knew this, he would not have killed the king of glory. But he killed the king of glory. And by the death, by the blood of Jesus, by the blood that was shed on Calvary, we have been made God people. And so we are God's people because Jesus died. We are God's people because he shed his blood. And so by the blood of Jesus, you and I have been made whole. And you and I have become God's people. And so I want to establish the fact that when we say God's people, we are not talking about the Jews any longer. When we say God's people, we are not talking about the Gentiles any longer. But when we say God's people, it is neither the Gentile, it's neither the Jew, but we are God's people. The church are the people of God. The church, this does not matter where you are coming from. It doesn't matter wherever you are, wherever you are coming from. The color of your skin doesn't matter. It, those things do not matter. The truth of the matter is that we are God's people. So you may be coming from the north, you may be coming from the south, coming from the east, coming from the west. That does not matter. The most important thing is that by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, by, by, by believing in the saving way of Jesus, we have become part of the church and we are God's people. Are you understanding me, church? And so we are God's people. But you see, having become the people of God has also given us some privileges. By virtue of the fact that we are God's people, we have some privileges. And I want to mention one or two. The first privilege or one of the privileges we have as God's people is that we have access to the throne room of God. By virtue of the fact that we have become God's people, we have access to the throne room of God. By virtue of the fact that we have become God's people, we have an unending access unending access to the throne room of God. We have access to the room of God. And what that means is that we do not need any intermediary before we can access the throne room of God. No. We have access to the throne room of God because we have become God's people. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, that let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. And so as a child of God, as part of the family of God, as a member of the people of God, people of God, we have access to the throne of grace. And the Bible says that let us come with confidence. And so as part of God's people, we go before the presence of God in confidence. We go without any fear or any doubt because we are part of God's people. We are children of God. And so we can confidently go before the presence of God. We can confidently go and access the throne of grace. So he says that let us come in confidence. Let us draw near in confidence to the throne of grace. And it is a privilege that God has given to each and every one of us because we have become his people. We have become part of God's people. And as a result of that, we go boldly and confidently. We go without any fear. We go without any doubt. We have access. We do not need any intermediary. In fact, you do not need me before you can go before God. You do not need your apostle or the pastor before you can access the throne of God. Because all of us have equal access to the throne of God. Because we have become God's people. You are part of his children. You are part of the people of God. And so you have access to the throne of God. And the Bible says that when you have access to the throne of God, the Bible says that we receive mercy and obtain grace to help in time of need. I came to encourage somebody listening to me that you have access 
you have unending access. Nobody can, can disturb your, your access to the throne room of God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. And so by accepting Jesus, by receiving him as our Lord and our Savior, we have an unending access to the throne of God. We have unending access. And when we go there, the Bible says that we shall receive mercy. We shall receive grace. Is there any one of us who needs mercy? Go to him because you have access to him. Is there anyone who needs grace? The solution, the answer is that go to him because you have access to him. You have become his people. You have become part of his people. And for that matter, the privilege that you have is that you have access to him. Number two, by becoming part of God's people, the Bible says that we have authority over Satan and his agents. And so the child of God has authority, has power over demonic powers and satanic powers. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, from verse 17 to 19, you see, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent the 72. And when they came back, they came and gave a report to him. And in verse 17, of Luke chapter 10 says that the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In your name, even the demons are subject to us. And let's listen to what Jesus said in verse 18. He said to them, look, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And what excites me is, verse, is in verse 19. Now behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So what it means that the devil has some powers, but God has given us authority by virtue of the fact that we have become part of his family. We have authority to step even on his powers. So Jesus says that I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and he says and nothing will harm you. And this is the authority we have as because we are part of God's people. As part of God's people, we have power over satanic forces. We have power over demonic forces, occultic powers and all that. The Bible says that God has given us authority over them. Because, and listen to the words that Jesus said. Jesus said that, I have given you authority. Jesus never said, I am going to give you authority. But he said, I have given you. So what it means that the authority has already been given us. We have the authority as people of God. We have the power as people of God. To them that believe in his name. He gave them powers to become. He gave them authority to become his children. And so not that he is going to give us the authority. Not that he will give us the power. But I'm happy to announce to you church. That Jesus has already given us the powers. And authority in Mark chapter 16, the Bible says, from verse 17. Now, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, they will cast out demons, ah, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Listen, this is not a promise only for the pastor. This is not a promise only for the apostle. This is not a promise only for the elder. But this is a promise for those who believe. He says that for these signs will accompany those who believe. And what are the signs? That in my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak in new tongues. In my name, they will pick up serpents and with their hands, and they will drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them. People of God, I came to make you aware what God has done to you, and the kind of authority and power that you possess by 
the fact that you have become part of the family of God, by reason of the fact that you are part of God's people, God has granted us authority over demonic powers, over satanic powers, over occultic powers. Listen, and that is why we do not walk in fear. No, we do not walk in fear. That is why we do not walk in fear of occultism. That is why we do not walk in fear of demonic powers because we have authority over them. He has given us authority over them. We are part of the family of God. We are part of the people of God. I want you to be excited about this, that I am part of the people of God. And by reason of the fact that I am part of the people of God, I have authority over Satan. I have authority over demonic powers. I have authority over evil power. So, I have mentioned, people of God, that the first thing that God has done for us by making us part of his people is that he has given us access to his throne. And then, number two, he has given us authority over Satan. But let me add this one, people of God, that by becoming people of God, God has blessed us. If you look through the scriptures very well, you will discover that the people of God are blessed. They are blessed. The people of God are blessed in this present stage and even the age to come through Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so, we need to understand that as people of God, we carry the blessings of God. As people of God, we are carriers of the blessings of God. God has blessed us. Not that he's going to bless us, but God has blessed us. The Bible says that he has blessed us with every blessings, every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And so you walk as a blessed man or woman. You walk as somebody who carries the blessings of God. People carry a lot of things along with them as they walk around and as they travel. But I came to tell you that as a people of God, one of the things that you carry is the blessings of God. You are a carrier of blessings. And that is why whatever you touch must be blessed. And that is why whatever you do is blessed. And that is why wherever you go, you carry the blessings of God along with you. Because as people of God, we are blessed. We are already blessed. We are blessed of God. And so let us understand that we are the people of God and we have access to the throne of God. We have powers over Satan, authority over Satan, and we are blessed. Hallelujah. But becoming a people of God also comes along with a responsibility. And then I will just mention one and then we pray. So the position we have as the people of God also places on us a responsibility. And that responsibility is for us to be Christ-like. Christ-like. We have become his people. In fact, his name is upon us. We carry his name. And so having become his people, one responsibility that we have is to be like him. Indeed, it is the will of God for his children, really, to reflect his image, to reflect the image of his son, to be like Jesus in all aspects of our lives. The Bible says that for God knew his people in advance, In Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. And so the reason why God chose us 
and made us his people is for us to be like his son. So that his son will be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so his son, Jesus, wants many brothers and sisters. And then he chose us and he picked us and made us his own so that we will be like his son, Jesus. And then when we are like his son, then his son, Jesus, will have many brothers and sisters. And so God has called us and has made us his own. He has made us part of his people only for one reason, that we shall be like Jesus. So by the way we talk, by the way we act and behave, by the way we carry ourselves, there is only one objective, and that objective is that we must be like Jesus. The responsibility that we are becoming his people or the responsibility that we have become his people that places on us is for us to be cast in the mold of Jesus. The fact that we have become his people, it places on us a responsibility. And that responsibility is for us to be cast in the mold of Jesus Christ. Even in this crooked world, the world is indeed crooked. The world is full of corruption. The world is full of evil. The world is full of sin. But in this crooked world, God has chosen you and I and has called us to be part of his people. Why? So we will demonstrate Christ, we will reflect Christ to the world. And so people of God, I came with this message of hope that when we talk of God's people, we are talking about the church. It is no more the Jew, neither is it the Gentile, but it is the church. We are God's people. We are those that have been chosen by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, he has made us his people. And this has brought us some privileges, access to his throne, authority over Satan, and the fact that we are blessed. But this same position also has given us some responsibilities. What is that responsibility? The responsibility is for us to be like Jesus. I want to encourage you, brother. Let's go out there and demonstrate Christ in everything that we do. Let's go out there and demonstrate Christ at our workplaces. Let's, let's show forth that Christ. Let's remember that the church in Antioch, the Bible says that they didn't go out there announcing to the world that we are Christians, that we are followers of Christ. No. But the people looked at them and saw them and saw the way they behaved and said, these are Christians. And so that is what is expected of us, people of God, that we shall go out there and demonstrate to the whole world for the world to see that indeed these people are the people of God.